Professor Anupam Chander. Uh, we are very honored and we are very delighted that he's, he went from Washington to uh, deliver this keynote today. Um, I think it's not uh, Anupam's first conference with the chair. I think it's the third time that he participates in uh, our conference, but it's al always a, a pleasure. And, uh, and I, I already know that we are going to learn a lot from him. Thank you for being here. Let me begin uh, by thanking my hosts at Sciences Po in particular. Of course, especially Florence Gassel. Professor Gassel is chair in digital sovereignty. Uh, and I want to thank her for being such an essential connector between Europe and the United States. Uh, Florence t truly makes possible the transatlantic flow of ideas. Uh, so in my lecture today, I want to talk about the future of the data protection framework, uh, which facilitates data flows across the Atlantic by returning to the past. Uh, I will argue that desire for trade has powered the growth of international privacy law. Today we hear that trade undermines privacy, uh, but I want to show a history of how trade strengthened privacy. Uh, and it's trade that will likely continue to propel the growth of privacy law again and again over the next few years. Indeed, the data protection framework is further evidence of this very thesis. Okay. Next slide, please. So in a, in a recent paper, Paul Schwartz and I argue that privacy and trade are currently on a collision course. With a regulatory thicket of differing privacy laws across the world, making it harder and harder to trade. Governments understandably worry about foreign jurisdictions uh, that may not have the same protections for privacy uh, as they have at home, uh, and uh, increasingly intervene to block data from flowing to countries they believe lack sufficient protections. In the process, governments are effectively declaring many foreign companies unwelcome because they may transfer personal data to foreign shores that lack adequate protections. Now, only the largest companies are likely to be able to have the resources to traverse this regulatory thicket. So this is, uh, you saw some of the debates uh, earlier today about this very question. Um, and so uh, our paper, Privacy and Our Trade, uh, argues that this is uh, becoming an alarming problem because the GDPR has been extremely successful. The Brussels effect does work. That is, lots of other countries have adopted the GDPR, and that will actually increase other countries that now put bans on how their data flows, uh, which, will, which unless they grandfather the European Union in, which they have not done as a matter of course, um, means that even the European Union might now be uh, unwelcome to receive data coming from elsewhere. So one of the arguments that was made in the prior panel was that we only send data out. Well, actually, as an American, I'm constantly sending data to, the Europe, uh, to Europe. Okay, If I pull up my Mercedes app, it tells me my data is flowing to a number of countries within Europe. Okay, so lots of data is coming to the United States, uh, from the United States to, to Europe and from the rest of the world to Europe as well. So this is, uh, and not only that, just I just want to make another uh, slight uh, observation about the conversation before. Um, European companies want data to flow outside to American companies. That B2B uh, exchange is important for European companies, so that European companies can have access to all the world's companies as service providers. Um, and so you, it's, it's like saying you can only buy domestic cars, cars made in France, okay? That would harm other European companies that use cars uh, if you did that. So just keep that framework in mind as you think about these questions. Okay, uh, Paul and I, by the way, have a new paper coming out in, uh, uh, if you can press click, um, 
uh, a new paper coming out in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, which is talk, talks about uh, uh, national security concerns uh, in this context as well. So look out for that paper, which we'll post uh, in the next few weeks. So today, today, let's go to the next slide. Today I want to argue, oh sorry, we can go back one slide here. Yes, right here. Uh, today I want to argue that framing trade as a threat to privacy is misleading. <laughs> Um, rather than undermining privacy, the economic imperative for commerce across borders has driven the adoption of privacy law over the last four decades. When I, when I say this, when I tell you my evidence, you will find it blindingly obvious. Okay? It sounds controversial at the start, but it will become extremely obvious. Bruno already knows exactly what I'm going to say, would tell you for the next... <laughs> so for 20 minutes, okay? Uh, but, uh, but it sounds controversial, but it shouldn't be, okay? Um, so um, I want to begin by recounting, uh, it's easy to believe that cross-border data flows are an issue of the internet age, an issue that affects Google, Facebook, and Netflix. But of course, the issue goes back to the dawn of computing. Take three examples. Let's begin with the fire brigade in the 1970s in Malmo, Sweden. Okay. In the late 70s, a fire alarm in a factory in Malmo, Sweden would trigger an alarm at the local fire brigade, right? But it would also trigger a message sent via satellite to a general electric computer in Cleveland, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, that is. Uh, which would in turn inform the Malmo Fire Brigade before it took off uh, about what it should expect to find in the warehouse when it arrived, so that it would have prepared for the relevant type of fire. Uh, concerns about the political risk of sending data to the United States in the 1970s led the computer server to be moved closer to home. The case earned the attention of the Swedish Data Inspection Board head, Jan Fries, one of the pioneers of data protection law. Um, and uh, I couldn't find actually a really good photo of him for this, uh, for this slide, but, uh, but OK, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to show uh, cars uh, and vehicles for a little bit. Uh, in 1989, Fiat's subsidiary in France sought to consolidate employee information to its headquarters in Italy. The CNIL uh, protested because Italy lacked a national data protection law. Fiat then contractually agreed to provide the, quote, the protections for human rights and fundamental liberties required by France. Uh, in effect, Fiat agreed to abide by, abide by French privacy law in Italy anticipating, of course, the approach of standard contractual clauses that is quite familiar today. Okay. Um, and in 1995, uh, right at the dawn of the modern uh, regional uh, data protection instrument, Citibank was launching a credit card, if we can go to the next slide, with German railway company Deutsche Bahn. I should have had a picture of a Deutsche Bahn train at this time to complete my uh, little tour of 1970s, 80s, and 90s uh, vehicles. Um, the Berlin Data Protection Authority was troubled by the fact that information was to be processed in the United States. Citibank made headlines when it entered into an agreement permitting Germany's data police to come to the US to inspect its data processing arrangements. Okay, so as these conflicts show, uh, these issues have been with us for decades and decades. Um, in fact, policymakers, if we can go to the next slide, had even coined a name for the issue, trans-border data flows. So what we call cross-border data flows have long been, been known as trans-border data flows with an acronym TDF. Uh, the first reference I could find in uh, an English language uh, uh, journal was in 1974, okay, to transporter data flows. Uh, and these are articles from the late 70s, early, uh, early 80s um, that talk about the problem of transporter data flows. 
And by the way, when you are an academic writing about the subject, you can suddenly be humbled by the idea that 50 years ago, someone thought exactly what you're discovering today. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, so there was a simple and elegant solution to the privacy challenge for trade. If a country with privacy law was reluctant to see its citizens' data go abroad to less well-regulated zones, then why not simply introduce privacy law in those places, right? So the birthplace of European privacy law is the German state of Hesse, which, uh, so if we can go to the next slide, which enacted its first data protection law uh, in the world in 1970. Um, it would not take long for policymakers to begin worrying about how the absence of data privacy laws or various in such laws would frustrate trade. In 1973, the Council of Europe adopted recommendations that encouraged countries to avoid creating discrepancies between legal systems. We go to the next slide, which would undermine the Council's goal of closer union among its member states. But it was the OECD um, and. Uh, uh, that would create the foundation of the modern privacy trade formula. If we can go to the next slide. Um, this is from uh, a photo I took yesterday um, uh, with, with the mansion donated by the Rothschilds to the Marshall Plan, apparently. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and now uh, passed on to the OECD. Concern about the interruption of trade due to regulatory gaps in privacy proved a key motivation for all of the international privacy instruments entered into in the 80s and the 90s. Let's begin with the first of these instruments. So in 1980, the OECD adopted the Guidelines Governing the Protection of Privacy and Transporter Data Flows. The, gui the OECD export group at the time was chaired by the Australian Michael Kirby, who served as a justice in the High Court of Australia. Uh, next slide, please. And we can see Justice Kirby's own views in an article he published contemporaneously in the Stanford Journal of International Law. Justice Kirby anticipates the essential contours of the arguments that would follow over the next half century. He begins by observing that some countries were adopting data privacy laws. However, protective legislation in one country could be readily circumvented by storing data across the border. Uh, beyond the jurisdictional control. At the same time, he notes the possibility of data protectionism. The first reference I have found to data protectionism is in 1975, by the way. If you can imagine, all right? So these, these concepts have been around for a long time. Data sovereignty, digital sovereignty, these, question, these questions were also around in the 70s, OK? Uh, so it's, it, these battles have been fought for a very long time. <laughs> okay, uh, what is his solution? What is Justice Kirby's solution? In order to avoid unnecessary restrictions on transporter data flow, it's imperative to agree upon international standards, thus the OECD guidelines. And if you go to the next slide, and the following slide, uh, the OECD guidelines offered a solution um, they were built on two cornerstones. First, a commitment to a set of fundamental data privacy protections in national law. Okay? That is uh, the first requirement. And second, and uh, contemporaneously, okay, an agreement to permit flows of data across borders. Once you've set up the foreign law, you can now send the data, and you cannot stop the data from flowing. Okay, um, so this was the the uh, uh, the framework set out in the OECD guidelines. The first cornerstone, of course, laid the foundation for my uh, is the is the basis for my thesis. It is the foundation for globalizing privacy law. The second cornerstone would lay the foundation for trade, okay? But they were always yoked together. You, if you wanted to trade, you needed to establish strong privacy rules, okay? Um, so reflecting on the OECD guidelines 30 years later, Justice Kirby noted, one does not normally think of the OECD as a major player in the global elaboration of human rights. 
but he said the important human right that was at stake was shown to have significant economic implications, deserving the attention of the OECD. Okay. Uh, and here, what I want, I'm also trying to do subtly, <laughs> not so subtly, is say that fundamental rights can be connected at, in very significant ways to economic rights. Um, and the two should not be considered as living in two separate spheres of life. Um, we see here the two yoked together at the foundation. Okay. The formula would found, form a foundation, uh, as I said, the basic architecture of international privacy law, beginning with uh, what, uh, Europe, Council of Europe's, Europe's Convention 108. And I'm going to skip forward a little if you go to the next slide. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, and, uh, and of course, continuing on to the Data Protection Directive as well. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, here is the Convention, uh, the convention 108, uh, which, which of course establishes also, we think of it as a privacy convention, but if you look here, the free flow of information between peoples is a key uh, part of the opening recitals. If we go to the next slide, and we can go to the next slide again. Um, and this is in the very uh, uh, foundation of European data protection law. All right. We know the European Data Protection Directive uh, by that name, but I should just, it's useful to pull up the full name. That's just the short form that we've adopted as a convention. Uh, but the full form, if we can press the next, uh, if we can click. Um, the full form of the title has free movement of data in the very title. Trade was always at the heart of the European Data Privacy Project. Okay, this, the free movement of data is there to support trade. That's what it's there for. Okay, this is an economic project at heart. Um, and so, uh, with of course, yoked to these human rights concerns from the start as well. Okay. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. And it's not just in the title, it's in the first article of the directive. Trade is at the heart, okay? Those cornerstones that I mentioned in 1980 are replicated in 1995 in the start, in the framework of how the Data Protection Directive works. That's the deal that it makes, okay? So this is, this is all obvious when you look at it, but that's, but that's the foundation, okay? Um, now you might say, ah, the directive, that was the version one, but we have a version two, and we've rewritten and reconsidered, and we have a new, much more elaborate data privacy framework in Europe, the GDPR. Well, and you might think the title of the GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. And there you would be, Slightly mistaken again. Okay, let's, if you go to the next slide, it is, if you look at the, reg, it's the what is the title of the regulation? It is the regulation of the European Parliament on the protection of national persons, blah, 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 on the free movement of such data. It still has the same bones as the 1980 OECD guidelines. Okay, it's in the very title. If you go to the next, uh, if you click once, and again, it's in Article One of the GDPR. This is not uh, this is not forgotten. It's in the very foundation. Okay, the free movement of personal data is repeated twice in the first article. Okay, this is this is a trade facilitative project. It's about trade and privacy. It's not, it's not privacy uh, neglecting trade. It's very much in the service of trade. Okay. Um, 
So, so not only, so, um, the, uh, so we see various European states adopting privacy laws at different speeds. Um, you remember the Keneal concern about Italy. Um, that is a serious concern. It was not the case that all of Europe had a European view of what privacy meant. There is an invention of tradition here as well, uh, a kind of uh, epistemological understanding of what, what it, it means to be European, uh, which, is, which comes out of this Europeanizing project. OK. Um, not only did the EU membership spur the adoption of comprehensive data protection law uh, among the member states, it required member states to assure that any existing law met the European standard. This required active vigilance by the Commission. In, in 2000, the European Commission sued France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Germany, and Ireland for failing to notify all of the necessary uh, provisions in the Data Protection Directive. So uh, they were all, this was also a project to ensure, ensure that the, uh, the parts of, uh, of Europe, even that already had data protection law, uh, actually met the terms of the, uh, of the data protection directive. OK, so let's go to the next slide, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and of course, with the expansion of the EU, we see the same requirement. To, exp to, to gain accession, one had to adopt the acquis the law of the European Union at the time. Um, and to be, to, uh, to be considered for accession, you had to, uh, to show your compliance with this acquis. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Here, for example, take the report on Bulgaria's progress towards accession from 2004. Uh, <laughs> The law on data protection is not yet fully in line with the acquis. Okay. Um, hey Bulgaria, please change your law. Please, please adopt our law uh, to make it in compliance with what Europe requires if you want to become a European member state. Okay. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. And so you see the expansion. This is a little slide I did showing the expansion of national privacy law within Europe through 1995. Um, and, uh, and so you see, when I, when I say uh, adopted it at different speeds, it truly adopted it at different speeds. Some adopting it after the data protection directive is being negotiated during the process of negotiation uh, itself. Um, next slide, please. And I know that Switzerland's not a part of EU, but um, anyway, we'll <laughs> I, I included some European states uh, that are EFTA states, I believe. And um, anyway, OK. So here, of course, is the expansion of national privacy law within Europe as uh, the EU also expands uh, itself. All right. Um, so. The accession reports also suggest a significant shift in the EU's own thinking about the role of data protection within the regional integration system. The accession reports long framed data protection within the chapter on freedom to provide services, demonstrating the trade imperative at play. More recently, however, data protection has been considered within the fundamental rights section of the report. So there's a really interesting move taking data protection in the accession reports from freedom for, to provide services to fundamental rights. Uh, uh, okay, a possible explanation, of course, the influence of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which was declared in 2000, coming into force in 2009, uh, and perhaps shifting the, the way that these are framed within the union itself. Okay. Um, now, of course, the framers of the Data Protect and Privacy Directive were not only concerned about the free movement of data within the union, they understood its importance between the union and the outside world as well. And so they invented, they innovated a, 
the host of mechanisms to allow data to flow uh, outside the union. Um, so data-free flow with trust was thus an established European practice before it was named uh, beautifully by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, um, as Mira Buri has uh, noted, uh, the e EU has also pushed for more safeguards requiring its partners to adopt appropriate measures to ensure the privacy protection while allowing the free movement of data, establishing a criterion of equivalence. And in the Chile uh, EU FTA, for example, the data protection provision can be found under the title on economic cooperation um, and has a uh, you know, commitment by Chile to adopt uh, data privacy law. Okay. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Perfect, that's it right there. Um, but this leaves a puzzle. If privacy law were essential to promoting international trade, how did the US avoid an omnibus privacy law? Again, US exceptionalism comes to uh, the rescue. So the US did not adopt a broad privacy law. Instead, then Bill Clinton started negotiating heavily at, at the end of the 1990s uh, with uh, the European Commission to allow for a sui generis, a uh, special regime for the United States that would allow uh, companies to certify uh, to these kinds of protections. Uh, enough to satisfy the European Union, uh, or at least the European Commission, as, uh, uh, to that extent. And we know the story. We, we, uh, this has been well rehearsed today, from the safe harbor to the privacy shield and to now the modern incarnation uh, data privacy framework. Um, so the US could rely, so as Paul Schwartz has noted, um, the European Union was keen to continue trade with the United States, giving the United States leverage in these negotiations. In light of the EU's goal of promoting successful external trade for its single market block of member states, the US represents its most valuable economic relationship. It's hard not to be tr uh, transferring personal data between your most valuable economic relationship. Uh, that is uh, ru ruinous for both parties. Okay, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about the kind of theoretical uh, yoking together of privacy and trade. And if you wanna to go to the next slide. So the, one of the great thinkers of European data privacy law is Spiros Simitis, who just passed away. Um, he was the first commissioner of data protection in the European Union, in the world, in HESA. Um, and um, he was, uh, uh, he has a very famous quote, privacy is not bananas, okay? Um, so some argue that privacy cannot be considered within trade law because that would subject a human right to an economic regime. Privacy is a superior value to trade and therefore should not be considered within a trade framework. Uh, this is not bananas we're talking about as, the, as uh, Spiros Simitis declared. And as Svetlana Yakovleva and Kristina Irion observe, personal data is peculiar in the ways that it combines the dignity of a human being with economic uh, properties, valuable commercial activity. So, and you know, I think it's fair to say that bananas do not carry information about our likes, dislikes, health status, and where we were last Saturday night. Uh, but the comparison requires more unpacking. First, linking the two does not imply the superiority of trade over privacy. What I've shown you is a joint effort, two, two regimes joined at the hip, uh, supporting each other. That's the, that's the framework I've suggested um, of international data protection law. 
linking privacy and trade doesn't downgrade privacy as a value inferior to trade. Rather, it says that trade can be restricted when it serves privacy to do so, but not when privacy is a fig leaf for protectionist or discriminatory motives, um, some of which I've heard here today, frankly. Uh, okay, uh, and so that is what trade law disciplines the abuse of national law that harms trade in ways that are discriminatory or unnecessary to achieve the normative goal. Okay, so if the goal is to be protectionist, to push the foreign supplier out, then trade law says that isn't a basis for, uh, that isn't a legitimate basis to protect privacy. But if the goal is to protect privacy, that's a legitimate foundation for stopping that flow. Right? That's, the, what, that's the trade law framework. It's about discrimination, not about saying no to privacy. It's simply saying, when it, can you hold something private even if it fo flows across borders? The second, the example of bananas shows the way that international trade law, so if we can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, OK. Um, and, oh, I might note that prime, privacy is often the prime example of the Brussels effect in action. Anu Bradford's work was referenced here today. Uh, uh, one of Bradford's primary examples of the success of Brussels uh, is data protection. Uh, and so uh, the, the Brussels effect is very much connected with, and what is, what is the framework of the Brussels effect? It's the large market of the European Union that gives the European Union its outsized leverage to effect its laws, to project its laws elsewhere. What does that mean? It is the desire of other countries to trade and sell into that market that helps lead to the projection of European law into those spaces. Right? So the Brussels effect is an example of this very, of my thesis, of trade be facilitating the growth of privacy law across the world. All right? It's the very, you know, the, the central engine of the Brussels effect in Anu Bradford's account is the desire for others to access the European market. Okay? That is to engage in trade. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. The other part of the story is uh, for the trade lawyers in the room, you will recognize that there has been a huge banana trade controversy involving the European Union for that lasted decades. Trade law actually had to deal with bananas for a number <laughs> of years. Okay. Um, and it was based upon a his colonial relationship that European Union had um, with some of its former colonies, giving favorable banana tr treatment to the bananas of certain of its former colonies. Not on the basis of the quality of the, of the bananas, but on its historical, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of historical reparations, I think. Uh, you know, in lieu of reparations, I should say. Okay. Um, so, the uh, so phytosanitary rules supported by so by the World Trade Organization help assure that bananas can be grown anywhere and consumed safely everywhere. These rules rely on international food safety standards. They don't require any country to lower its own food safety standard uh, if there's any scientific support for those food safety standards. There is a scientific basis uh, requirement in the, in, the, in the description. And today, we consume bananas from all over the world, whether they come from former colonies or not, uh, safely. Uh, and uh, my suggestion is that we can consume services from across the world safely as well. All right, I'll conclude. Uh, history shows uh, that privacy can support trade. Um, and uh, the two have reinforced each other and can continue to do so. Thanks very much. I'm 
I'm going to put Bruno on the spot then. Uh, <laughs> the story of the OECD framework connecting it to the GDPR. Um, how does that, all, all well known to you, um, but is this in some sense forgotten at times in, within uh, these dialogues? Okay, okay. Um, so the, the kind of uh, the trade facilitative uh, role of privacy that the OECD uh, creates. And you yourself said earlier in your remarks that uh, the GDPR is about flows. It's about uh, you know, s uh, sending data. And it was also echoed in one of the other, uh, in Ilias's comments uh, in particular. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you think that, um, yeah. So I think that I mean, where you're right, uh, I will agree and disagree with you. I will agree on the fact that in the DNA of, of privacy rules in the EU since, 90, <laughs> since the Directive 1995, there has been, and we have heard also that maybe that market doesn't even exist within the EU, but uh, um, there, there, there has been, it's based on two um, I think on complementary approaches or on um, being protective of data but open to data exchanges and how you, uh, how you square that circle. And to square that circle, you have <coughs> data transfer mechanism. The, the, uh, uh, there has been never, localization in a certain sense has never been part of the DNA of data protection rules in Europe. On the contrary, from the beginning, uh, they were a uh, transfer mechanism. But it was also very clear from the beginning that, and it's, uh, it's truer today, of course, that you should avoid circumvention of the EU rules. And that transfer, if not based on safeguards, is the perfect way to, to, to circumvent uh, the requirements because I mean, it's a matter of one or two click and then transfer data abroad and it's subject to other rules. It has also become, become an issue of level playing field. That any uh, offer of goods or services in the EU, whether the provider is established in the EU or abroad, is subject to the same rules. That's also very important. Um, and that's why we don't believe, actually, and that's why I disagree, that trade agreement can deal with this. We believe that for the free flow of data, we have specific tools, adequate decision, contractual clauses, et cetera, that are subject to specific requirements. And we are using trade agreements when it comes for data to, to do something else. And that's true for the FTA we have uh, signed with uh, Chile or concluded with Chile, with New Zealand, uh, with um, uh, uh, and others, uh, with the UK as part of both. We believe that there is, and it's not an easy, dividing line to draw, but there's a dividing line to draw between uh, genuine data protection laws and data and digital protectionism. That they might be obstacles to digital trade that have nothing to do with privacy, but uh, with other, uh, including abusive reasons. And that's why we have ban in our new trade agreements a certain number of obstacles to digital trade. But at the same time, and that's the provision you were quoting from Chile. We don't want trade agreements to govern in any way, that's part of our sovereign choice, if you want, or regulatory space, to govern in any way the level of protection. If I want to put my level of protection at seven uh, and uh, another part at six or at 10, that cannot be uh, 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 governed by the typical trade tests that you know better than me. And that's why in all our trade agreements, we have also clear provision on what we call our regulatory space. And, and, and the fact that trade agreement cannot be uh, um, invoked to contest our, 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 our autonomous choice, if you want. That's, that's the, another way to square that circle. And it equals a bit what we discussed before, that all of this is a question of striking the right balance. And um, we try to be a bit less naive, because at the end, all of this is about access to market. Uh, and a bit also more assertive 
uh, in both uh, pursuing our offensive interests, but also certain defensive interests. So the only, um, um, what I, how I would respond to that would be to note that the effect of excluding um, trade disciplines from uh, privacy spaces means that there's no way to discipline actual legitimate data protectionism, right? Um, by carving out that sovereign space, that, that effectively means that it's, un, it's only regulated by yourself, um, which means you're determining whether or not this is a, a violation or not. Uh, and that is, I mean, I understand the reason that you might want to preserve that sovereign space, but it does. Let me also say, yeah. we are far from being the only one doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the, the protectionists in the rooms are not the one you think. <laughs> when the US, you know very well there's a security carve out in all trade agreements, which is purely, uh, meaning, uh, how do you call it, that you judgment, self judgment. Uh, um, at least the privacy, for, for the privacy exemption, we have included the condition that you need to have tools for transfers, that you can invoke that exemption, so that if you want, that exclusion of uh, uh, um, uh, privacy legislation from the trade test, but only if you have that system that allows you also to export data on the basis of objective criteria, et cetera. So it's not a completely self, self judgmental uh, 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 provision, uh, less than others. <laughs> I, I agree with you on the question of uh, uh, lots of c company, countries being uh, uh, not consistent entirely on, the, on such matters. So. Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, your outstanding speech, and thank you for all of our uh, um, speakers uh, for the whole afternoon. What I what I retain from this uh, from uh, these discussions, even if I had to go sometimes for some political uh, talks. Uh, um, first, is there is a I, I retain first point. There is a matter of security about uh, data sharing and data protection. I think we can see the United States after uh, September 11 or. Uh, or Europe have uh, decided some uh, sp specific moves just uh, to to fight against terrorism and the other side to defend uh, citizen rights. And it was particularly uh, amazing to see how, how there, are, there are two periods of uh, increased of progress. Uh, there's the end of the 70s and then the, f the, the years of the 90s, just before the birth of the internet or the expansion of the internet. And it's always been amazing to, to me to see that uh, uh, lawmakers uh, were, were not prepared already for the internet, of <laughs> course. But and at some stage, um, regulators and uh, lawmakers were able to 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 draw a framework just before we, we needed it. But now we have to adapt it, probably. And, the, um, and I would, the, the, and because um, probably that we are in stage of the freedom of data sharing, as you stated, uh, is probably uh, a new topic, a new trend in the discussion. I'm still amazed to see that when I talk with citizens about data protection, that many people are willing actually to disclose their data or to share it, to share them, especially in the health sector. You know, if you say to some, somebody that uh, uh, can, w w w anybody can win some uh, life expectancy uh, increase if uh, we if data sharing is properly done, then people will of course will stick and will uh, comply. So it's, it's all about the procedure of protection and the way people are dealing with it. I, I'm much more confident in the ability of uh, countries to, to settle an agreement on the way that are processed than to deliver a sort of uh, international law about privacy rights. It's maybe the same, but maybe uh, it's only a matter of discussion. And the third issue I wanted to mention is about the framework for discussions. I used to be for three years uh, the, the head of the unit of the Treasury in France uh, in charge of, um, of trade uh, talks. And I've always been convinced since then that uh, trade frameworks, especially WTO or even bilateral or uh, 
uh, international, um, even not on a global basis, are a proper framework to discussion. And I was amazed to see that when Joe Biden had been elected President of the United States, in a few weeks, you, the European Union has been able, especially under the governance of Merkel and the, 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 the leadership of Germany, to settle a deal with the United States on a wide range of issues, uh, from taxation of cars that the, the Germans wanted, and I mean reduction of tariffs that uh, mm -hmm. Trump has decided, and on the other side, the regulation of the GAFAMs, and we settled a, a rapid. So at some stage, in some kind of circumstances, uh, privacy, or I mean the, the right of the internet, is a matter of negotiation. And I remember also the United States uh, uh, ten years ago, where I built, we tried to post uh, an initiative in Geneva, only with free world uh, or um, of or member states of the WTO uh, eager for, for privacy of speech, free to to reach a sort of an agreement on, on sectorial basis. And uh, I hope for the best, and uh, we can uh, deliver some progress in the near future. And that this re meeting has uh, give us some uh, thoughts and insight on it. Thank you. Thank you again, Monsieur le Député, for hosting us. I just have one question, or perhaps one word that crosses my mind, and that I don't think has been pronounced today, which is China. Uh, <laughs> because we are talking, you know, about U.S. companies transferring data to the U.S., but I'm, I, I'm just wondering, we are also concerned about data transferred to China, and I think the U.S. is concerned. So, so since we are all in this room, maybe if someone has a few comments to, say, to make about this question. Um, so I think, uh, so uh, I would go to the... Uh, the uh, uh, a member of parliament, um, the I think this is a huge issue in the United States. The federal, the main federal bill that is being that is on the table that has bipartisan support, has a provision that simply says that if you are transferring data to China, you have to specially inform people. That's the that's the way that the United States is. If that bill is passed. That's the special rule that's th made for China. There are also now very special rules that are through executive orders, but uh, as was said earlier, executive orders are very powerful uh, tools in the US toolkit. So it's not, uh, you know, I wouldn't dismiss an executive order so because of an executive order. Uh, the executive orders in the United States that give the president power to stop flows to China uh, if they, if the if he or she determines that those flows should stop, so they can ban an app, they can do a variety of things that are, I think, rem like a little bit surprising. This is part of the paper I'm working on um, with Paul Schwartz. Uh, so there is that's what's going on in the United States: executive power uh, to block flows, and possibly if the national data privacy bill comes is actually passed a requirement that there be uh, notice that data is flown to China. <coughs> On China, of course, China is the elephant of the room. And uh, as some, in some, in some extent, I mentioned China without saying the word at the very beginning of the meeting this afternoon. Well, what I remember about China is uh, sort of uh, compliance with the idea of the United States that they want to divide the world in two, China on the one side and the U.S. and the free world on the, on the other side. And when we, when we consider the regulation of uh, the, the, the payments, for example, uh, I was in Treasury when we decided and to stick to the position, I think, to forbid any way, any capacity of Chinese banks to be involved into the payments in Europe. And um, this is one of the many uh, aspects where uh, we, we certainly don't want to, to settle or to invest into any kind of pipe that would deliver or transfer data to China. And we, of course, there are many, many other ways to, to deliver data to China. The first one is TikTok, of course. But the agenda of TikTok in Europe in the, in the near term is probably the same as the United States. We will say that it protects uh, the kids, and that's truly necessary. 
considering especially the PISA uh, outcomes and the results. But of course, what is behind is the transfer of data too. Three things. First, we will see a lot of enforcement. There are many cases on uh, processing of data before data protection authorities right now in Europe on China. Process both processing of data, by, including by TikTok, and transfer to China. So this will increase. And when we see uh, uh, enforcement, it means also litigation, etc. It will give some variety, let's say, to our typical data transfers uh, conference. Second and this is true for the EU and, and the US and many others, it shows also that data is not only a question of privacy. Data is a question of national security. Data is also a question of investment control. A lot of this Chinese, Chinese rather authoritarian regime access to data are also addressed through investment control tools in the US, in the EU, and so on. China and transfer to China and because all of, a, all of a sudden the US discovered that you need maybe some requirements on transfer to data, and a few years ago it was a ideological taboo, data is a commodity, we will never uh, introduce requirements, has been, I think, of a sort of wake-up call in the US. The fact that the US has taken m measures, like for instance prohibiting already transfer to data from the military, I mean, from the, the use of certain Chinese application by the military, is a, an example of that. And that brings, of course, the EU and, China and, and the US closer on data because they have a common challenge, which is something that was missing before, probably. And they have a common <laughs> challenge, which is not about solving their, their, their reciprocal problems, but a bigger challenge. Well, thank you so much to all of you uh, for your participation. I think it was a very uh, stimulating and inspiring uh, conference. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, Professor Shander from, for coming from the US. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Rottenberg who came from Washington as well. Um, many thanks to Ilias Chansos and Bruno Giancarelli who came from Brussels as far as I understand. Uh, from all the other participants from Paris, but who took the time to come here. From Switzerland as well. Um, and again, so thank many thanks to Martin for hosting this second panel with so much talent. Uh, and, I'm a, and I apologize if I, if I uh, for forget a few, a few names. Uh, but it's, it was a pleasure to, um, to, to um, organize this conference today. We will uh, probably post uh, the, the videos uh, on the chair's website. Uh, and again, very, uh, a very uh, big and uh, warm thank you to Emmanuel Lacresse, who made everything he could for us to be here in this very room uh, today at the, at the Nation National Assembly. Thank you.